Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, um, coming from Switzerland to our neighbor. Um, I will sort of try to set the stage. Perhaps I should also say that I have been elected by industrialized countries as the co-facilitator of the Structured Expert Dialogue, and as such I have the job to bring the best available scientific knowledge to the climate negotiations, which we just have done on the 4th of May. We have prepared our report, and which will feed into the negotiations towards Paris, the COP21. Um, so what I will do is sort of summarize uh, the entire scientific knowledge uh, to, to, to set a little bit the stage for this conference. What I would like you to take home are the following take-home messages. The physical science base is very robust. Human-caused warming is clear. Risks can be managed via mitigation and up to some limits via adaptation. Unless emissions are radically uh, and soon reduced, Warming will impact soon some ecosystems, significantly, for example, coral reefs or northern hemisphere sea ice biome. Um, and unmitigated climate change, as currently projected, will exceed the adaptive capacity of most ecosystems and thus would come with most severe impacts on their structure functioning and allow me, Christian, if I use here services. Um, so I, I'm going to have two parts. The first one is basically on the physical science basis, and I will talk about observations, attribution a little bit, uh, projections and implications of those projections. Observations. This is um, animation of our instrumental period record since 1884 with uh, the baseline from uh, 1880 to 1950, and you see blue deviations uh, versus this baseline, which are cooler, and you see warmer deviations, orange, uh, yellow, orange, or even red color. You see that this climate system is, of course, also very complex. It's very dynamic. Um, never conclude from a cold winter or a very hot summer that we have climate change, please, uh, as you can clearly see. But that's the situation as we have here uh, up to the present. And um, the IPCC Working Group 1 very clearly says then that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And this is, for instance, visible in this graph, showing decadal averages, where we see, in, particularly in the most recent past, clear, a clear warming trend. And IPCC very carefully phrases this, that each of the last three decades has been successively warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850. And using really a long enough period, like 30 years from 1983 to 2012, it was the warmest period since the last 1,400 years. And this warming is only 0 0.85 degrees, what we're talking about here. Um, perhaps you heard about a slowdown, a so-called hiatus of the warming in the last 15 years. I will come to that a bit more. But where did the heat go? IPCC again very clearly says that the upper ocean has uh, accounted for more than 90% of the additional heat due to the greenhouse effect which was available at the surface. And we have also, since the 70s, an increase in the deeper oceans below 700 meters of heat transfer. Nevertheless, despite this alleged hiatus, uh, where even a most recent paper is questioning this uh, and saying it's actually an underestimation, but I don't go into that detail. The last 15 years, if you look at it, then you can see that 14 years out of those last 15 years are the warmest measured, with one exception, 
and that is the year 2000, which was even a La Nina year. Uh, we also see in many, many systems, glaciers, ice shields, uh, in the ocean also, uh, which has absorbed about 30% of the emissions from anthropogenic sources, that we have a clear trend of acidification, a pH reduction of about 0 0.1. And we also see changes in extreme events accordingly. Uh, for instance, here, extreme events in Europe, summer temperatures, where you see that uh, 2003 is not even the most uh, outlier relative to the probability density function. 2010 in Europe was even hotter than 2003. Attribution. Uh, globally average greenhouse gas concentrations have increased uh, unprecedented since at least the last 800,000 years. The carbon dioxide concentration alone has increased by 40% since pre-industrial times. And this is primarily from fossil fuel emissions, but also from land use change. Um, if you look at how these changes in the atmospheric chemical composition have contributed to surface temperature, IPCC also summarizes that in this graph quite nicely, where you see here uh, radiative forcing contribution uh, as it correlates to the observed warming. And then you see the contribution from greenhouse gases. You see other anthropogenic forcings like dust, aerosols, and so on, which actually rather tend to be a cooling. So the actual greenhouse gas contribution is larger than what we have observed. And the net result of the two is basically 100%. So you can say in the second half of the last century, the human contribution was 100% to the observed warming. Natural forcings pale relative to uh, the human contribution. That's just one argument. What, what is, of course, also as important is, of course, all the other fingerprints which we can find in the climate system, like the temperature uh, behavior, the temperature distribution in the atmosphere, the cooling at the top of the atmosphere, and so on, which all fit this uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, enhancement due to human activities. So IPCC says this human influence has been detected in warming of the atmosphere and the ocean, in changes in the global water cycle, in reductions in snow and ice, in global mean sea level rise, and in changes in some climate extremes. And this evidence for human influence has grown since AR4, and which resulted in this important statement, it is extremely likely, that means a probability of 95 to 99%, that the human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Projections, what emissions do? Um, Continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warming. And perhaps I show you also this graph because there is a lot of confusion about this. Um, if we would stop all emissions at this point here, for instance, right away, completely go to zero, then what would happen in the climate system? Would it continue to warm? Yes, indeed, we would have less pollution. And because of the reduced pollution, we have a small peak in temperature as a, as, a, as a response to that. But this is rather insignificant, because if you look at it on the very long run, then you can see that actually the temperature would stay the same for centuries and centuries. So that means every temperature increase which we allow will basically stay with us unless we remove that carbon out of the atmosphere and transport it in some, sequester it in whatever other system. Might it be the soil, might it be the biosphere, might it be the oceans. But we are locked in with our activities, with our infrastructure in making further emissions. And that is the reason why the scenarios by IPCC, like a business as usual scenario, as you can see here uh, with this RCP 8.5 projections, uh, an unmitigated climate change with many models, as you can see here, 
uh, up to the end of this century, or then with some even continued up to 2300, this would bring us a warming over pre-industrial temperatures of 8.3% according to the best estimate. But it could be much higher, it could also be smaller. The uncertainties, of course, become very big. Um, if we would ambitiously mitigate climate change, as it is close to this RCP 2.6, uh, where we can say it is likely that within this century, temperatures will not exceed uh, 2%, and likely means a chance of 66%, it stays below that, and a chance of 33%, it is over that. Uh, that's this, this, this green um, pathway. And you can see, for instance, by the end of this century, the climate, again for a period of 2081 to 2100, the average RCP 2.6 gives us, for instance, at the poles, even temperatures much higher than the 2 degrees, which has, of course, consequences for ecosystems. And with an RCP 8.5, it is, of course, much stronger warming. But it's not just temperature, of course, climate change affects the water cycle. Uh, uh, we can see for RCP 2.6 also changes in precipitation patterns. By the end of the century, uh, we, we have a, a, a strengthening, you could say, or an enhancement of the, the areas which are already dry, so a continuation of those trends, and in other areas we have actually an increase in precipitation, as uh, it is expressed in particular here. Uh, or here in these zones in the RCP 8.5 scenario. What are the implications? Uh, there are many. Arctic September sea ice extent, for instance, is projected according to RCP 8.5 uh, to, to go basically to zero after the uh, uh, 2050 in the second half of this century. In a very strongly mitigated situation, RCP 2.6, we might have still some sea ice at the end of this century. Uh, global ocean surface pH will continue uh, slightly to, or, or slowly, gradually, to decrease even further. According to RCP 8.5, RCP 2.6 would sort of stabilize the pH lower than it, what it was, and that will nevertheless have impacts. And global mean sea level rise will increase. So according to RCP 2.6, we have uh, 26 to um, uh, 55 centimeters, yes, and uh, according to RCP 8.5, we have 45 to 82 centimeters by the end of uh, the end period of the century, so that 2081 to 2100, and by the end of the century, 98 centimeters, so all basically a meter at uh, the upper end of, of the uncertainty range. So something about ecosystem services in a changing climate. I will say a few things about ecosystem services in general to set the stage, impacts framework, and managing the risks. So on ecosystem services, this is well known, but I thought, and, and setting the stage a little bit, uh, I will repeat that. So we distinguish between uh, provisioning services, uh, which you will talk about tomorrow during the workshop mostly, so food production and so on. Uh, then we have very importantly also regulating services like carbon sequestration. Christian Kerner will just after me talk a lot about that, so I won't say much about this. Um, but there are many other uh, so-called uh, regulating services like flood erosion or stabilization of slopes and so on, which are attributed to the functioning of ecosystems. And we have, of course, also cultural services, recreational, educational, spiritual. And all this is supported by the so-called supporting services. The Millennium Ecosystem Report has uh, claimed that biodiversity maintenance doesn't belong to it. I believe, I'm a strong believer, that actually we should consider that biodiversity uh, is maintained by ecosystems uh, despite all the theoretical difficulties we have by fully and convincingly understanding this. Um, now, ecosystem services uh, have sometimes uh, been uh, estimated uh, by monetizing them, and that's a very questionable approach. Nevertheless, I'm going to say something about it, despite I personally question it a lot, 
because it is an indication of perhaps that sometimes in our decision frameworks we are not properly recognizing the role of ecosystems. And that is somehow indicatively at least expressed through this very famous study uh, which came to the conclusion, it's already a long time ago, 1997, compared estimates, monetarized estimates, which are very uncertain to be between 16 and 54 trillions US dollar per year. Uh, and so sort of the best estimate being 33, while the global GDP at that time was 18 trillions, showing that actually ecosystems, according to this study, would to our well-being add at least a doubling of all other economic activities, or maybe even a tripling. Uh, and that is certainly indicative that ecosystems play a very substantive role, which is not in the markets, which is not considered if you only base your decision making on markets. Uh, and I think this is something which, which has to be seen very clearly. Um, now, impacts framework from the IPCC uh, is new in the AR5 by emphasizing what is actually a risk and uh, what is also a risk for ecosystems, for instance. And it is not just climate hazards which play a role uh, or the natural variability which plays a role like coming from weather or anthropogenic climate change. It is several components. One is the hazards, that's the sort of the traditional view, but the other one is the vulnerability of the exposed um, ecosystem, for instance, and then the exposure itself. Um, and a lot of also human infrastructures, of course, uh, are very variable in terms of, of, of their exposure. And only the overlap of all these three elements actually creates the risk. And in addition, this, this view is important because this, this tells us that it is very difficult for science alone, and particularly also for ecology, for ecosystems, to estimate the risks, because it's not just a, a question of uh, the um, natural properties uh, of, of these ecosystems which determines those risks, but it's also that the anthropogenic influences, socioeconomic responses, uh, like if you take agriculture for instance, how we actually going to respond to a changing climate can make a huge difference. We can also mitigate climate change, we can adapt to climate change, uh, we can have good governance or we can have less good governance, uh, either emphasizing some of these processes or actually putting barriers in front of these uh, and, um, activities. And so this all will influence the emissions, uh, also land use will influence that and again have a feedback on risks. That makes everything a bit complicated and IPCC has then decided in the working group two report in particular to estimate risk levels with, for instance, current adaptation and then also um, estimate risk levels when by assuming that there was the highest possible adaptation implemented. And uh, this scheme was used to um, assess 106 key um, in, uh, risks in all regions, in all sectors, and I'm showing here just for ecosystems a few, like polar regions uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. What is striking is that you don't find this possibility according to these estimates to reducing these risks. So these are some of, of the systems which are considered to have almost no adaptive capacity. And if you go to coral reefs, for instance, it looks similarly. At the moment, it's a, a, a bit better, and we will hear much more about coral reefs also later. So I'm just summarizing here a little bit. This is one example, uh, an episode in the Great Barrier Reef 2002, where we had a warming of one degree in the sea uh, surface water and that of, of over a month, which led then to this bleaching with 96% mort percent mortality in this area. This is a bleached coral at low tide. That's why you can see it, otherwise it's submerged. And um, we have estimated in the assessment report for the risks for these type of coral reefs to be, become rather high 
uh, because we would have a chronic bleaching if global temperatures over pre-industrial levels would be uh, increased by 1.7 degree. Now, according to the newest uh, assessment in AR5, this has actually been corrected, and the estimate is now around 1.3 degrees. Um, and one of the reasons is at that time we were mostly looking at model projections which uh, emphasized temperature change but have not considered uh, interactions between ocean acidification and temperature change. And as you can see, for instance, temperature which can lead to bleaching uh, and pH can also uh, impact on coral reefs. But we will hear much more about that. So I'm just going to show you here the summary from the IPCC report, which uh, looked at ocean acidification alone or ocean acidification and warming combined and what that means in terms of risks. Uh, red means high risk, uh, bluish red means very high risk, uh, white means no risk or no detectable risk, and orange or yellow is something in between. And you can see the 1.7 degree is somewhere here. Uh, when you look only, for instance, at ocean acidification alone, then this would sort of match where high risks start. And now, according to the latest uh, findings, 1.3 is sort of where, in combination, high risks uh, uh, are uh, uh, given for uh, coral reefs. And similarly, for terrestrial and freshwater species, uh, here the IPCC report has um, also made a very nice compilation of all the migration rates, assuming that uh, migration uh, has to in, in order to, to, to allow, the, to track the habitats for species, uh, to have a certain speed only, and the RCP climate change scenarios differ also in terms of the, the rate of change in the temperature, meaning that also migration rates would have to be higher with a higher um, uh, RCP 8.5, for instance. And they found, um, sorry, they found that on the global average, where you look at the altitude, where it's much easier to track the temperature changes, um, uh, averaged with flat terrain would uh, mean that actually um, with an RCP6, it becomes high risk or starts to become high risks for most species. And when you look at only flat landscapes, then you see that already for an RCP 4.5, only an RCP 2.6 would actually be not high risk uh, for most uh, species on average. So managing risks. Um, you all know that in Cancun at uh, this conference uh, after Copenhagen, it was agreed that the world should try to change its policies to not exceed two degree warming. And this was actually, this, this idea stems actually, has a history, and it stems actually from the knowledge as we had it with the third assessment report 2001. And I have put here the five risks of concern, like risks for unique and threatened systems where ecosystems belong, risks for extreme weather events, distribution of impacts among countries, aggregated impacts, and particularly economic impacts, and then risks of large-scale discontinuities, like the West Antarctic ice shield would, would very rapidly um, melt and so on. Um, so the two degrees you see here, and you see, as I said before, red, very high risk, or high risk, and orange something in between, and white means uh, no detectable risk or no risk, or even beneficial effects from climate change. Um, so that's how they looked. Now watch carefully these um, amber diagrams, assessment report four. Uh, so I go back again and I show it once more. That's assessment report four assessment. And if you take assessment report five, this is a, basically a confirmation of AR4. And that is one of the reasons uh, that actually many parties are now calling for having another long-term global goal of 1.5 degrees, and particularly also based on the report uh, I, I have just mentioned before, which I have prepared with my Chinese colleague in, in, in my May. 
I find this a bit unfortunate, but we can perhaps in a discussion come to this point. What is really key is that the IPCC has put together in a huge synthesis effort all the knowledge. Here, the five reasons for concern. Here, uh, this effect from uh, the uh, climate system not forgetting, sort of, or having a memory for temperature, which actually then means that the cumulative emissions is what is really important to determine such a long-term global goal. And that means, for instance, uh, we know the more we allow temperatures to grow, the higher these risks, according to these five risk, reasons for concern, become. So we could say if we care for the world, if we care, for instance, for ecosystems, we can set a target like the two degrees, as we have, all our governments have done in 2010. Now that means that actually we have a very clear cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emission uh, corresponding to that, that means a carbon budget. And this carbon budget is such that it also means uh, for emissions that they have to follow a certain emission pathway. And this emission pathway, for instance, we can read it from this graph for, every, for any goal we want to set. And this means, for instance, here in this case, the two degrees uh, target means we would have to reduce emissions by 40 to 70 percent globally by 2050 uh, relative to 2010 levels. It also means that we have to become carbon neutral or CO2 net emissions should be zero by 2055 to 2070 and all greenhouse gases net emissions become zero by 2080 and uh, 2100. Those are sort of the targets uh, which are consistent with such a goal of two degrees. Um, so, that's why also G7 has said we should have zero greenhouse gas emissions by the end of the century. But actually the figures uh, I just mentioned, the, the actual years. Unfortunately, current emission trends, they are just going up, as you can see here. Um, we are now at very high levels of emission and we don't see a change in those trends. And I believe this is the most uh, uh, important thing which we have to do, we have to deviate from those trends. 1.5 versus 2 degrees doesn't matter. <laughs> we have, because even for a 3 degree world, we have to deviate from these trends. Um, and I just want to show you this is also, we know this, we can quantify it, but it also is quite a challenge. And this is perhaps illustrated here. If we take a um, mission pathway with, which is consistent with the RCP 2.6 or a two degree goal, you could say, then the emissions should start leveling off here between 2010 and 2020 and then uh, starting calming down. So that would be immediate action, no deferring of actions. And this would mean that we would have, for instance, between 2030 and 2050, a median of emission reductions of 3% per year, which is still quite a bit. Now, current pledges, according to the so-called Cancun pledges, now the really actual pledges, no science is there yet, the robust one which would have estimated what that means. But the, 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 the best available pledges uh, are the Cancun pledges for the IPCC report at least, and that means delayed mitigation. And delayed mitigation is still not, you can't say it's impossible to keep warming below two degrees. It's still possible with that, but what it means is if you delay ambitious mitigation now, it means you have to have even more ambitious mitigation later. And it means, for instance, for the period between 2030 and 2050, a quite stronger uh, reduction pass, that is one of 6% per year reductions. 6% per year globally. And it means also, instead of only a ramp up of 90% of renewables, you would have to a ramp up of 240% of renewables in this very same period, which is a dramatic change. So in the, in the structured expert dialogue, we call this a radical transition, no fine tuning. 
of business as usual. It's a radical transition which is called for uh, according to all these data. Um, now, for ecosystems, this, of course, uh, means two things. Um, we have already started to change the climate, so it isn't hell or high water, it is now both. So we have also to adapt ecosystems, and I just want to say one thing, which also emerged from uh, the IPCC Assessment Report 5, that is, is the so-called ecosystem-based adaptation uh, which might be often overlooked, which is sort of defined as integrating the use of biodiversity and ecosystem services into climate change adaptation strategies and avoid maladaptation uh, through physical engineering approaches, which might actually then be not only expensive, but actually start also impacting on the ecosystems and therefore uh, reducing their contribution to a resilient um, livelihood. This is, of course, in particularly important for uh, poorer uh, um, and, and developing countries. So I hope I uh, haven't bored you too much. Everyone is sleeping here when one talks about the threatening of the existence. And uh, yeah, <laughs> everybody wakes up. And my daughter always says, Dad, why don't you show this cartoon? So I repeat my take home message is the physical science basis is very robust. The human caused warming is very clear. Risks can be managed via mitigation and to some limits via adaptation, given you have some adaptive capacity, of course. And unless emissions are radically and soon reduced, warming will impact soon some ecosystems significantly for instance, coral reefs or Arctic sea ice biome, and unmitigated climate change is currently projected will exceed the adaptive capacity of most ecosystems, and thus would, I'm particularly thinking of the next century, and thus would come with most severe impacts on their structure, functioning, and services. Thank you.